Today we wanted to do something a little bit different. We want to start a new segment, kind of like old reader, new readers, where I go back and reread something and Maddie and Amanda read it for the first time with me. But this time it's watching movies, because I feel like Amanda has a lot of movies she hasn't seen, a lot of classic movies. So I gave her a, like five list of movies and she went through some of them and she yeah. decided to watch Superman, the 1978 version. So what are we going to end up calling this segment? This segment's going to be called Our First Time View Review. There you go. Stay so tuned. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Reels Talk with Amanda and Omar. Um, as you guys know, today we're going to be talking about Superman, the uh, 1978 film, with directed by Richard Donner, starring the infamous, may he rest in peace, Christopher Reeves, mm -hmm. as our Clark Kent Superman. And Margot Kidder, too, who also passed Kidder. away. Yeah. You've obviously seen Superman before. When yes. was the first time you've seen A this lot. film? I was four years old when, the, when it aired in Peru, in television, so that's when I watched it with my mom and dad, so it is quite significant in my life yes. what Superman is. Like, it, it's, it's just that Im impactful of a movie to me. If I were to list my top 20 movies of all time, Superman would be on that list. It's wonderful. So. so I watched it two times, and what I can gather just from my first view is I completely understand the cultural significance of this film. This is the film, to me, from which all of our superhero films that we now know and love today have derived from. Right. It is a stapled film in American history, well, in, in film history in general, because it's the first time that you went to the movies and you knew what to expect. People that didn't read Superman knew who Superman was. Yeah. So automatically, you went to the movie theater expecting this character to pop from the comic books. Because, I mean, there had already been, like, radio serials, TV yeah. shows, the cartoon, and, of course, the comic books, toys, things like that, for yeah. 40 years by the time this movie came out. Now, this movie came out in 1978, so then everybody... They really took a gamble. It's like, who are they going to cast? Who are they going to cast as Jor-El? Who are they going to cast mm -hmm. as Lex Luthor? Or Luthor, Luthor, as Gene Hackman says it. Lex Luthor. You also have to think of the times, too. This is the 70s, when right after Vietnam yeah. and all that. So we needed something to give us hope. I feel like the same way that Spider-Man in 2001, or I'm sorry, in 2002, it yes. was post 9-11, right? And that spoke to that generation. That's why it's it that, that will stay with those kids that were... That, that were part of growing up with Spider-Man in their lives, those Sam Raimi movies. And that would be me, because to me, now Spider-Man 2 is still, to this day, one of my favorite Spider-Man films and superhero films. Okay. Yeah. But that that was the 70s, so that's what this was. This was after Star Wars, but this set the bar for every other superhero movie. And I think it is probably one of the most important movies that we've had. Yeah in cinema history. Now, what did you think about it? Let's talk about the story. Yeah. Uh, written by Mario Puzo, Godfather, and Richard Donner was the director. Now, Richard Donner originally wanted to do two movies, right? To film it back-to-back -back like Lord of the Rings. Yep. So the original ending of this wasn't the original ending intended. It was supposed to be the ending of part two, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's talk about the movie. How, what did you think of the plot as far as, like, introducing the origin story of Superman to the audience? Like, what did you sure. think? Sure. One what we've seen about Superman, we've it follows the same path it talks about. It has the prologue, if you will. You have his father on Krypton. You have the introduction of our villains that we don't see in this film, but I'm assuming we see in other films, like General Zod and Ursa. <laughs> and, of course, you have Marlon Brando, which I was surprised to see him in the role of Jor-El, especially considering it's just a brief, if you will. Can't, it's like in the introduction. You see him once, you once again... I, Whenever, um, I would say it's brief, but it's one of the most powerful and parts. impactful parts of the movie and the entire series as a whole is that little the speech that Jor El gets. Yes. He lives inside of Super anyway, Go Yes, no, yeah. Um so it was definitely I mean, to me it reminded me a lot of how a lot of origin stories mm -hmm. in our in our superhero movies are playing out. Now what I did find interesting is how long it took and it's a two and a half almost two and a half hour movie. Yes. Um so how long it took from Clark Kent to become, grow up and become Superman, usually our films these days, you know, they have a very kind of brief origin story and then they s slowly get to the part where they're going to become that superhero um, and then they eventually become a superhero, but not the full superhero. And this, it was like, he, they showed him in Smallville and he went and he, and then Jonathan Kent dies. But then he leaves 
Smallville to go to the Fortress of Solitude, where he's there for like a decade or... Yeah, it's about yeah, 12 years about or 12 so. 12 years, yeah, where he's learning about Krypton. Now, we don't necessarily see all the trials and tribulations through there, right? No, those no. are edits. It's all edits. They don't need... Yeah. So when we get to Metropolis and he dons up, it's like he is Superman, which in modern films... It may take an entire origin film for him to eat, uh, for a them to wear the actual costume they're going to wear. Or an entire season, or like entire Daredevil. season, like Daredevil, or in Smallville's an entire series until even if he even dons yeah, the costume. So it's just that's a little bit different for me. That's not something I'm used to, where mm -hmm. they kind of cut out that portion of it. What like he's becoming Superman in the Fortress of Solitude. We don't see that. I want to say that's probably the halfway point, though. So it's it is, not, but then it's we not, see, yeah. Yeah, but you're right. Like, he just quickly changes into Superman. And then, yeah. And, but yeah. that is, I love that scene, though, when he has to save Lois, uh -oh. and he has to find a telephone booth. Oh, And yes. he finds the booth that's not a booth, so he has to run around. I was like, oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it reminds me of Sam Raimi's more lighthearted Spider-Man films, but it's definitely, um... There is a lot of hope in this film versus what we've seen, like, definitely not a Dark Knight trilogy or definitely not the Henry Cavill Superman. Um, there is just, it has gravitas with his character. It has very goofy, uh, to me, a very goofy uh, supervillain. Lex Luthor. Yes. This Luthor is not the Luthor I'm used to. Not from any iteration that I've seen mm -hmm. in movies or, you know, he is definitely a more kookier character, which is, with, I mean, he's clearly a. He Gene reminds, Hackman leans into it. He I mean, reminds he does me it well. more of a Bond villain yes. than what a comic book villain would have been at the time. Because you got to think too, like they borrowed elements from the comic books, but they did their own thing. Yeah, including the way that Luther was portrayed, and that is the way with his, they with, made with him Otis, more. That was his sidekick, yeah. and Miss Tashmasher. Yeah, so he <laughs> kind of had his own Jimmy Olsen and yeah. Lois Lane, right? <laughs> you had that trio. You're right. Like it's 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 a different take on the character. There's comedy, but there's a lot of it's definitely not as that that action because he doesn't fight in this really. He's doing well, he things can't he's, because yeah, he's he fighting can't. a human being. Yeah, and he can't. He's just doing yeah. really Superman things like saving people. Like yeah, almost like a savior, almost yes, like Jesus. Exactly. Which <laughs> in a lot a way, of people make of, that comparison, well, right? right? Because yeah. the, whether they were looking for religion or whether they were looking yeah. for something else to believe in, people needed hope. And that's what this movie provided for them, the, that generation and generations to come afterwards. But you mentioned, to me, I think the part that got me and always gets me, it's probably my top ten favorite lines of all time, is... All those powers. And I couldn't even save him. That line and the way it was delivered, oh my god, I, I, I cannot keep a dry eye on it. Like, every yes. time I watch that scene, it's so powerful. Because you have this god-like being from another planet... Mm -hmm. whose powers are empowered by our son but it's like he can do anything even travel through time or turn back time turn. which we'll talk about that in a yes. few minutes <laughs> but he can't save his father from dying of a heart attack and i thought that was such a heartbreaking scene so lex Luthor's plan is of course land right yes he wants to buy land and destroy california so he can make that land lex worth, Luther land right <laughs> worth a lot more money yeah. so in the process of doing this he's destroying a side of california and Superman's trying to put the Earth back together, the yep. uh, the ground back together, but loses Lois Lane. Like, she dies. Yes. Now, he has a choice, because he, he hears his father, Jor-El, talk to him. Like, this is where, you know, you can't, you can't interfere in life's decisions like this, because it's not you. You're not a god. But he does. Now, whether he travels back in time, or whether he's actually making the world spin back in time, I don't know. That's up to anybody's interpretation. <laughs> Your interpretation. I thought he moved the world. <laughs> well, yeah, most of us did, but then there comes the then there's like, did the he really shift the on way Reddit? The yeah. <laughs> or any theories since the since 1978? Did he really move the world? If that's so, then blah. You know, I thought it was amazing, and when he screamed, yes, after Lois died, like he came too late, he got her out of the car, and he yells out and flies up in the sky. Holy shit! Even to this day, that still brings goosebumps to me. God, I love it. And then, yeah, he flies he to does. bring her back. And then he takes her out of the car, and everything's fine and dandy. And you could say the ending isn't perfect. You know, the ending is kind of like, oh, okay, we'll just end it here. Yeah. But I love the ending when he flies up and he looks at the yeah. camera and gives you that only Gotta Christopher yeah. Reeve <laughs> smile can pull off. But as far as the plot, you yeah, that's, that's pretty much what happens. It's a long origin but it is the origin of origins to me as yeah. far as a superhero movie this is the book on how you do an origin story and do it properly and do it justice by borrowing elements from the original source 
but doing your own, own thing, thing to and it. Doing, yeah. And I thought that was so good that they, they, they did that within two and a half hours. Now, I don't know how much the original cut was going to be because of the whole Richard Donner and the production yeah. uh, fight that they had. But that's yeah. another story. And we can talk about Superman 2 another day. Everybody makes fun of how boring and how much of a Boy Scout he is because yes. they don't understand the character. But he's always been a Boy Scout. Even in 1978, he was a Boy Scout. He was, he had it's not going to change. He, was, yeah. he had that Smallville mentality that I thought worked phenomenal in a movie. And God damn it, I wish they would make another Superman movie. Close to... With no angst with just what we have. Well, I mean, it's hard to do, right? It's it, it's it's set the bar for superhero movies, but Superman movies. It's like, where do you go from here? You try to do Superman Returns, eh, you're hitting it close to home, but not quite there. Got it. And you Man have three? and then you have Man of Steel. Holy shit, Superman is dark, and he's killing villains. And, yeah. And then you have Justice League, and it's just really difficult to capture that magic again. I can't imagine being in charge of that, but... I wish I job, wish somebody right? would because a difficult job. I think we need that in this generation. We need a great Superman movie. We need a Superman movie that knocks all other superhero movies out of the bar because the name Superman and the character should be more recognizable than Guardians of the Galaxy, Groot, or Rocket Raccoon. And it's yet weird. Groot is. It's weird. weird. <laughs> yeah, it is weird. It's a weird time we're living. Let's talk about the cast. Yeah. So they, they went out and it's going to be, first of all, impossible to cast Superman. Clearly, we've seen this in well, modern days. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's impossible. Yeah. Nobody lives up to the task of casting Superman. It's just, yes. you can't happen. You know what he looks like. It's not like he stands out because he has a crooked nose or anything like that. No. It is a good-looking farm boy, but can pull off this swarmy kind of character and this Boy Scout at the same time. Like, the perfect casting. To me, it doesn't get better than Christopher Reeves. I have to like, agree. Like, I know a lot of people like George Reeves, but Christopher Reeves... And I'll, and I'll tell you the scene is when he is about to reveal to Lois that he's Superman, he takes it back. And you are literally in one take watching him just take back the scene where he puts on his glasses and he becomes Clark Kent again. Yes. In, in, including just hunching his body over yep. to change his stature. Oh my God. Like that's, they don't make character actors like that anymore. I mean, they do, but it's just hard to find them nowadays. You know, I'd always heard from everyone, Christopher Reeve's best Superman, Superman. And so when I actually saw the film, I, you know, I had not seen anything else really, so I didn't know how his acting was, but he really does pull it off. The Clark Kent to the Superman. The yes. distinction is so clear. And I can see why they crafted Brandon Ralph later on. He really, I think, looks a lot like, like looks physically, I think. He looks, has. and also he was able to pull off Christopher Reeve's Clark Kent, not so much as Superman. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. So then you have Margot Kidder, who Margot played Kidder. Uh, Lois, Lois Lane. Lane. And what a different take on Lois Lane, too, because she's very human. I feel like... I couldn't help but... She smokes. She, she smokes. She can't spell, apparently, and she's a journalist. <laughs> very strong female <laughs> lead, too. Yeah, she is a very strong... For that time period. But I was always thought Lois Lane's that go-getter, you know, and she is supposed to be what Superman would find is to be the perfect woman. And what I found is that she's not perfect, but she is, like, because she has all her little flaws, her human flaws, that we all have because we're human, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's what made her so great. And I loved the scene, the interaction between the two of them when she's asking them questions, and they're out on her little veranda or whatever in her apartment, and just how well she played that you know blushing like you know she wants she's hard-hitting journals at the same time she's flirting with him and oh she's totally crushing on oh him, yeah adorable she wants to hide it. And, yeah she does such a good job of hiding that um and i i love that scene because he's like you should stop smoking it's bad for you she's like brushes him off like and he looks at her her lungs with the <laughs> x-ray vision now that well, it's 1978 you know the surgeon general warning how long has that been out really so yeah i see that <laughs> I think Mar Mar Marlon Brando was great. Uh, yeah, as, as Jor -El. Jor -El. But I did, I, I did read later on that that scene where he's talking to Baby Kal El, where he actually didn't want to rehearse it because he wanted it to be real, so they had to write the lines on the diaper. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That sounds like Brando. <laughs> that sounds like Brando. Okay. Um, but no, I mean, I mean he's, coming, he's coming a off very the... gravitas Jor -El. I mean, well, that is. He's well, I mean, him. coming off the of Godfather, you knew what yeah. to expect that when you got him. Brando <laughs> <laughs> casted as Jor -El, so it was great. I think everybody else. Gene Which Hackman was great I for love the Gene Lex Hackman. Luthor that he played. I mean, yeah. like to me, the character of Lex Luthor is the exact opposite of Superman, right? Like yes. you have Superman who is this godlike creature, this being of goodness, who's wonderful and good looking. Then he has to hide it, right? He has to hide it by wearing glasses and looking dorky and stuff. Where, where you have Lex Luthor, the exact opposite. He 
he hides the fact that he's human and vulnerable because he hides the fact that he's balding and aging. Yes. So much and so that he wears plays a upon wig, how right? how smart he is. Right. And because at first, so there's, the, when he discovers and realizes about the um, kryptonite and that it would be his weakness, and I'm thinking, how did he figure this out? It's like this whole one take and he's talking to Otis and Miss Teshmasher. I keep pronouncing Mr. Master her name, but, um... <laughs> Who was casted beautifully, by the way. I yeah. had a huge crush on that woman. And I kept, um, watching that scene thinking, how... But I realized, okay, because he's the smartest person in the room, so this is how Lex Luthor operates. He's going to try to deduce to the fact, because that's how he operates. Yeah. And that shows his intelligence. He keeps saying he's the smartest guy in the room, so he's proving it right now by recognizing, oh, this meteorite landed here. And this is must be his weakness. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I love the casting in the movie. Now, let's talk about the dialogue, because it seems to me, I think, out of everything, special effects can be cleaned up and stuff. But besides that, I think the dialogue might have been dated if you if you go about it. And, yeah. and then it's one of my hokier parts is when the, the the part to me that I love and hate is the Peter Pan flight scene, right? Where he, he takes grabs her, her and, they and, and she's like, Can you read my mind? Uh, can you read my if that dialogue had been left out, that would have been the, one of the just, most iconic scenes yeah, of any movie. You might have just started singing a whole new world. Well, um, I mean, I get what they were doing, but yeah. I didn't. I, you I didn't mean, need it. Nobody needed it, right? Well, and that's and that could be. Now we wouldn't. You I wouldn't see now that dialogue. Now you wouldn't dialogue, even right? see that it, scene, though. No, you wouldn't. You see probably that scene. wouldn't even see that scene yeah. nowadays. But movies. yeah, some of the dialogue was was hokey for me. Okay. And that was I had to put myself past that to understand to. You know, say okay, but this is 1978, and this is a different time, a different. You know, this is yeah to be expected. Um, at least I think so for some certain films. So once I got over that, I was okay with it for what it was. Um, now, if you saw that kind of dialogue in a superhero film today, I think it would get torn apart by critics. I don't think so. You I don't think, think so? I think it's a lot of the dialogue is very quotable and, and stands the test of time. Like the whole Jor El speech about humanity. Like we still use that in the Man of Steel trailer. But the, not the that speech stuff. From not Jor-El. that stuff. But just like the some of the dialogue between. Because like, like well, I'm think sorry. About, so what did you mean by okay? So some of the li- while dialogue. I liked the um, the interplay between Lois and Clark, um, Clark or Dur- yeah, Clark. Okay. There was some like when they were talking. Some of the lines were kind of. I mean, they were leaning on romantic comedy, kind of hokey. Something that I probably wouldn't see in a superhero film today. and Or if it was, it'd be faster, it'd be quippier, if you will, if they were doing it today. It'd well, be a okay, bit it's different. a different... I mean, but it's, but it's a different it, time. In the yes. same sense, you couldn't pull off the same kind of Mel Brooks kind of humor these days either. No, exactly. It's just a different time in the way yes. that we... What people find humor now. No, different yeah, than the way exactly they did back right, then. Yeah. But, uh, no, I agree with you. I think some of the, some of them were, were dorkier, but come on. Like, some of the dialogue nowadays is pretty bad. Martha? It is pretty bad. Okay, let's do I need to remind yeah. Martha? Or, oh, we don't have to remind me of Martha. I think about Martha Deliver us from, even that was in Spider-Man, which I, I love Spider-Man. But you know, there's just some hokey dialogue, and eh. it's a comic book movie. I mean, yeah. it's to be expected. It's to be expected, yeah. I love the contrast between Smallville and Metropolis. You have this small town that looks like a Norman Rockwell, Norman Rockwell painting. Norman Rockwell, yes from the 1930s that never really went got out of the 1930s even though it was the late 70s <laughs> and you got metropolis this huge city that is modernized oh, because it was modern. modern for the time yeah. so i thought they did an amazing job with that part but oh yeah well they definitely created i did like the set designs and i know that didn't they hand build like when they built the fortress of solitude and everything like that i mean i thought all of the set designs were fantastic oh, in it, well, what they were for the fortress of solitude right they wanted to step away from the comic books and do their own thing, which in the 70s, you know, you kind of had that similar future. And this yeah. is kind of what it looks like, including the technology that Lex Luthor uses. But it was really cool with the crystals and stuff like that. That was awesome. Like, And the entire fortress built like that, and the holograms. The holograms were great. That scene with the panels where they locked the, the three of them and they in go the into the Phantom Zone. zone yeah. <laughs> which, you're right, they will come back in the sequel. Oh, okay, but, I figure. <laughs> That was Karen amazing Stan for back plays then. Zod, right? Yeah, that, that was, was like, amazing back then. Well, and that well, that's what I was surprised by the special effects as well. Um, once I got out of my, oh well, that would have been so much better CGI. But would it have been better CGI the second time watching it? Because they did a lot of great stuff with these special effects. I mean, I could especially like whenever he was saving Lois Lane in the helicopter, I could see a lot of cuts, right? Because oh. they have to, right? Mm-hmm. Of course. Um, but there was some great special effects in this film. 
For this time, definitely. Yeah, I think so. The use of green screen and the use of wires, of course. But of the, course. the scene where he's holding the railroad so that the train can pass over him. Or any of the flights. I mean, they really... The tagline for this movie was, You will believe a man can fly. And many people went to the theater believing that. Like, they came out mm -hmm. going, Oh my God, how did they do that? As a yeah. kid, I was like... This is wonderful. And it did give me hope that if I fell off a building that somebody would come and fly and save me. It was that ridiculous childlike innocence that I had that a lot of people had. Would it hold up to our younger audiences today that might want to see Superman Origins back in the... I don't know. Are these kids on the phone watching two hours worth of YouTube videos? They're watching on the DC Universe app, maybe. <laughs> well, I'm just saying it's a different generation. It so is. a lot of kids are raised differently, right? Yeah. Some kids learn to appreciate movies a lot earlier in life like that's what i'm trying to do with my daughter it's like we're watching classic movies that i wouldn't normally my, most of my friends her, showed yeah. to their kids right um superman being one of them i showed her this movie when she was four years old and we watched it together and we loved it like yeah. she loved it she loved the soundtrack she knows the theme she knows the difference between yes, john, john williams, williams. And, so you, we'll talk about that in yeah. a minute. we'll talk about that in a minute because i think that is yes. one of the most important parts of this movie um i think i absolutely think it can it holds to what it once did. I think any four-year-old knows who Superman is, walks out of this movie saying, man, that was really good. That was a good, fun movie. It gives, it's like, he was a good guy. <laughs> he was, okay, yay, Superman. I Daddy watched it with my three-year-old, and she just kept going, is that Superman? And I was like, yes, yeah, that's Superman. <laughs> yes, Superman. Which she repeated several times because kids repeat things. <laughs> um, but you, you talked a little bit about John Williams in the score, and that's what I can remember about because I had forgotten, you know, I've heard the score outside of the movie, and I forgot how iconic it is, and it is John Williams. It is, like, it is John, John Williams. Williams, and I think they gave the task to the right guy, because... Oh, I can't imagine someone else know, not doing anything epic that you, he you, is who you go to. You have, you have, Star Wars is different, because Star Wars is a new thing, yeah. but this is an epic soundtrack, because you have a new character into the movies. You need a theme that both is new and catchy and epic and makes you think this guy's a superhero, but also it's the theme that you have been waiting for all your life. That is a hard task to, to do. Like, that seriously, is. because you, you may not realize it, but back then, you know, we didn't have superhero movies. And yes, I'm purposely forgetting Batman. So you have to nail it. You have to... You Anybody that hears that theme is like, okay, yeah, That's this Superman. is Superman. Yeah. Like, for the first time. And I love that theme so much. I jogged to that theme... That theme is one of my favorite themes of all. Like the Krypton, the planet Krypton theme, the 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 Superman theme. If they, holy shit, if they put the fucking Superman theme in Man of Steel or Batman vs Superman, the, those movies theme. would have been a lot better. I'm serious. You take that movie theme and you put it on the Man of Steel trailer. If you think about the current superhero films that we've had, not any of them have like a distinct. Well, maybe the Avengers to some point have a distinct theme, but a yeah. lot of them don't have. No, you're like, right. I miss movie themes. You know, I except miss for Spider Man, because they have the Spider Man song that they use as the kind of soundtrack for. It. But even then, can even anybody? Then. Can you watch it on another show and be like, "Oh, that's the Spider Man, Spider -Man theme. theme"? Not a lot of people would be yes. able to do that. Uh, but, Batman, but that's Batman, John Danny Williams, Elf, John Williams. Well, Danny Elfman did an iconic theme. Oh yes, Batman, Batman but, too. No, this, to me, this is the, no other movie, no other superhero movie has come close to even mimicking this, holy shit, this is the theme for this character. Like, yeah, it, it's, it's hard, and I miss him. that in movies, honestly, scores like this, but, no, he killed it. Saying all that, what did you think? Be honest. Like, Be what honest? What did you think of the movie? Okay, well, so if I take... If I take away the cultural significance of it and what it, what it means to like you and other people who watch the film, I mean, I would. It was okay for me, but in that and like I said, that could just be, you know, what, you know, my first superhero movie wasn't that. It was actually would be like Batman, um, the the Tim Burton, right? Okay. That would be my first superhero movie that I've ever seen, and so it's obviously a lot different than that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me, you know, even like even if I watched the original Star Wars, don't hate me, guys, I would still say, ah, there's some uh, the some of the dialogue isn't doesn't snap as well as I'd like it to. Or it's George Lucas writing the dialogue, he did it in episode okay, two. I don't like sand. It's coarse, rough. So now we get our villains. We want our films to be complex and kind of dark, but have like these different complexities to them. And you know, Gene Hackman's is your Bond villain. You're super. You know, very 
cartoonish type of character. There's not a lot of dimension or depth with him or his sidekicks, except for this test masher. Um, Who just wants to be rich. Yeah, and, and just wants to give Superman a kiss. It's It was okay for This me. is the longest rating I've ever heard. You're going on and, <laughs> and on. And I guess I'd score? give it like a... I'd give it like a 7. 7 out of 10. Okay. Uh, for me, I think it's... Do we need your rating? It's still one of the most important movies out there. I think it's a great mix of comedy and romance and superheroics and action. I love this movie. And 10 out of 10. Every Thank day. You. All day, every day. 10 out of 10. I don't know why Superman. he had to give his. I think it was pretty obvious. You don't know that. Oh, no. I did that. I, I hardly give thing. I give Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse a 10 out of 10. But, you know, it's Wait. just, it's so, it's so good, though. Yeah. It, it still holds the test of time. And so I'm glad uh, not a 5 out of 10. I guess no, I, I don't think I could do that. would have been off your own show. I don't think I could do that because I really enjoyed Margot Kidder, I really enjoyed Christopher Reeves, and Christopher Reeves especially. I think that's why I would give it a high, like, I just really enjoyed his performance of Superman. I, honestly, yeah, you're right, I can't see anyone else pulling that well, off. Well, it's hard. It's, it's hard. It's hard unless they change the tone of the movie, which they've tried. And they've tried, and it didn't work for people. Yeah, but we'd like to know what you guys think. So, if you've seen this movie before, what are your thoughts on it? Does our review make you want to go see it if you haven't seen it already? And if um, we've spoiled this 40-year-old movie for you, we're so sorry. Yeah, and if you want to watch it, um, I know you can watch it on the DC Universe app. So if you're one of those lucky few like me who Are they sponsoring us? That's like the second time you've mentioned the damn <laughs> Just DC trying Universe. to let you know. Okay. That's where you can watch it, for sure, on it, that. It was on Hulu and Netflix for a while, too, so I don't know where it is now. Yeah. Or you can, you know, buy the physical copy. Or buy a physical copy. still do that or not. Uh, physical copies. So Yes. Anyways, but thank you guys for watching. We really appreciate it. Make sure to hit the like and subscribe button and ring that bell for our notifications so you can see what's going on with Near Me Condition first. And Check out our social media. Yes, and don't forget that. Uh, if you have any suggestions for movies that Amanda should watch that are classics that she has not seen, yes, she has quite a few of them, especially in the 70s and yeah. past that. I've so. got the 80s down, but it's, it's before that. Where... She still hasn't seen Spaceballs. Which we will. Yes, we will see that, yeah. Okay. So. so, anyways, but guys, thank you so much for watching, and remember, if it's classy and cool, it must be a new man. You just take, you just start the whole thing. No, you say, welcome back to Amanda, oops, welcome back to Reels Talk with Amanda and Omar. Did brain slip? Welcome back to Amanda. <laughs> I guess you think it's what I did. No. Yeah, let me redo that again. Okay. Watch. Or re God damn it! Read, motherfucker! <laughs> English! Do you speak it? <laughs> oh my gosh, Omar. Okay. okay. One more again. 30 Omar. Fuck you. 30 take Amanda. So, what are we calling this segment? This is going to be our first time review. Nope. Ready? Okay. Yes, we got it out of the way. <laughs> we got it out. We Why good. are you treating me like I treat you? <laughs> I think... Okay. Dick's the bottom. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs>